Hello, my name is Marcus. I'm the compiler of a collection of therapy quotes entitled 1001 Windmills of the Mind. A collection of advanced self-help quotes taken from what's often called the psychodynamic or the psychoanalytic perspective, which long ago, as I understand it, was referred to by some as philosophical medicine or narrative medicine, helping one <laughs> Well, to find their narrative, um, that's medicinal, psychologically speaking. If we know our story, what happened to us, if we can admit, uh, recognize, accept, uh, forgiveness is involved in this process. Um, and uh, Hans Lowell describes this process as capturing something, giving it a time and a place. The ghost is laid to rest. We can enjoy the present kind of thing, not haunted by the past. Because with childhood trauma, we're stuck in the past. Uh, with a frozen fear that we kind of carry and repeat and replay. Um, so the psycho, psychoanalysis, uh, the general idea, um, it's to um, make us conscious of ourselves. So most of us is considered unknown to us. The stranger within, the second self, the secret self, the second self, the double self, the one who walks with me, who's not like me, who is me. Someone's living my life, I know nothing about him. In literature, it's the motif uh, of the double character. So that's the idea, to know ourselves. We want to get back ourselves that we lost. So a lot of us um, is unknown to us. That unknownness is called whatever, the denied self, the repressed self, and so on. Now, that this denied self, repressed self, and so on, it's filled with our given potential that we didn't have a chance to get to know because in trauma we don't feel safe to know it so we put it into cold storage freeze it up petrification turn to stone feeling unreal feeling numb and then we sleepwalking through life as a result so we're missing uh, who we're meant to be had we been loved uh, missing all that time of expressing our uniqueness um, this idea of knowing our uniqueness um, the child needs to feel safe to get to that place but if he's terrified of his mother early on he never gets to that place so this, you know, real self-capacities and your true interests, this is all repressed, denied. Robert Blythe describes it in the metaphor of this bag that we drag behind us. By the age of five, so much of who we really are, who we're meant to be, and so on, gets put into this bag. And we, like, the images like shadow, you don't see it behind you, so you don't see it, shadow, unknown, repressed. So the bag is the metaphor for the non-reporting brain, the implicit memory system. But we don't know what's going on in there, right? The memories are in there. So the memories are in there. So a lot of unconscious memories are in there. Templates are in there. Schemas are in there. Blueprints are in there. Maps are in there. Relational psychic constellations are in there. I.e. memories of self with the mother and the linking affect. Uh, so, so much of uh, us um, kind of gets recorded or put into this bag. We carry this bag as our shadow self or denied self all of our lives. And we spend the rest of our lives trying to reclaim, get back, we own, we synthesize, we have ourselves. That part of ourselves that we lost, we want to get it back. And that's the hero's journey in midlife, the second journey in midlife, the self-examination, self-reappraisal period, the midlife audit, the midlife examination period. Because usually in midlife, people get this hunch, where am I, who am I, you know, that kind of thing. So that's what, that's all that, that's all that jargon means. You want to like be a detective. So these 10,000 quotes we now have in our collection, 10,000 advanced self-help quotes uh, taken from this general know thyself perspective. They're helping us to be the, our own psychological detective, existential detective, emotional detective. Because one of the symptoms of childhood trauma is our feelings get stored and put in that bag. Imagine that, our ability to feel a wide range of feelings, needed feelings, appropriate feelings, aliveness of feelings, the radiance of feelings. That's the golden ball. The golden ball goes down the well. Similar idea. So um, we want to get back to the golden ball. We live to the extent that we feel. So that's a huge part of us, this so-called, we call it the feeling self, linked to our ontological self. Together, sometimes called, I feel therefore I am this self. This is whole, our, our whole embodiment kind of thing. And then an image for this whole embodiment, and the, it gets petrified, turned to stone, and so on, right? Because the emotions can't flow, so it hardens up, turns to stone. So echo, in other words, representing the soul of a person, became a statue in the narcissist myth. And then the person had to resort to the delusion that once upon a time in the uterus they were a little god, hence narcissist, 
is transfixed with the image of his reflection, thinking it's just about him. And because that's the state of the baby in, in the beginning, it's just about him. Um, yeah, another image is um, in the faithful John story that Robert Bly likes to tell. The faithful John was a personified imagining of this denied self. That denied self called faithful John became a statue. So that's a metaphor that we feel. Um, um, well, that, that we have a fear of our feelings called affect phobia, emotional iller illiteracy. Um, Jeanette Paris calls it um, the, the embodiment trauma, emotional hypothermia, emotional catatonia, emotional coma. Yeah, so one image could be the close of woolly mammoth in that block of ice up in Siberia or wherever that is, wherever, it is, wherever he or she is. Um, Velveteen Rabbit describes it as feeling unreal. And then uh, the woodcutter story, where he was praying for the little toy wood uh, boy uh, made out of wood to come to come alive. Okay, so Joseph Campbell summarized uh, his summary of the hero's journey is: we're looking to feel alive and real. So with child with childhood trauma, we don't really feel fully alive and real. Uh, right? That's what's missing. That's what's missing. In midlife, we got a recognition of that, and we're angry about it. Hence the Freudian slips. Hence the physical symptoms, hence the nervous breakdown. It's kind of come up. So this fragmentation, it's pain. It, nature is trying to heal us. It, so it, it's trying to come into our consciousness. And we're meant to have a dialogue with ourselves and get to know ourselves because in trauma, that capacity uh, to recognize what's going on gets all damaged. And then the trauma slips to the cortex and the cortex creates all kinds of fancy convoluted beliefs um, called relentless hope. Um, to, to, to chase for symbolic mother and you don't even know that you're doing it that way so that's sort of the one of our main points at the moment here so by the way yeah we're in the middle of um, well we're, this is part this will be part six of seven videos on the work of Arthur Janoff so I just discovered him uh, recently and uh, I think a lot of people heard his name and all this uh, a famous celebrity pop star celebrity endorsed him and, uh, and uh, so he became very famous by that back in the early 70s, I guess, or late 60s, early 70s. Um, so m many people have heard of him by that. And there's a lot of kind of, uh, you know, parodies about it or jokes about it. Uh, and it's, it's even entered into kind of a comedy skits and things. Um, but I'm not really interested in Janoff's uh, so-called technique to see if you can kind of uh, feel what you couldn't feel, get back your feelings and come back to yourself. I'm not sure of that technique, but it turns out he wrote 12 books. Uh, and uh, he's got a wealth of information, uh, done a lot of research. He quotes some real gems from some like medical journals and things. Uh, he writes clearly and simply and brings things together. Tries to sit, he tries to do his own kind of synthesis, I guess. So I'm mainly focused on um, sort of the knowledge that he's sharing along. I'm not looking at his technique. I don't even know what it is to tell you the truth. I haven't even read it. I don't think it tells it. Um, something about lying on the floor, doing some kind of rhythmic breathing, and then uh, some kind of visualization exercise. You feel this? Well, okay, go back. When did you feel that before? And see if you can kind of go back and get to that place where you were traumatized and maybe now you can kind of release uh, or feel or get back into yourself if you can kind of so-called uh, I'm not interested in, I don't even I don't want to I don't know I can't say more I don't even know what I'm just guessing at this point so I'm not interested in his technique but when when he but when he became famous flocks of people were flying to California oh guide me to this I, I want to get back my feelings I want to feel alive I was traumatized I want to so I don't know um, a lot of success stories um, um, a little conf I'm a little confused. I have a huge question mark about some of these um, success stories. It might have been a lot of actors just pretending, or and it might have been um, a lot of people confused. Maybe they're they're pent up, so they're so they're beating the pillow. Oh, I did, uh, am I healed? I don't even know. So no, Janoff says you, you got to kind of really be authentic. If his theory works, if it's true. The idea of it is you really got to feel that imprint and scream from that imprint place, um, not just uh, from something post that. 
that's something that bothered you and you're beating the pillow, but it's got to go all the way back like that. So it's not an easy process, I guess. So like, once again, I, I'm not, all throughout our, our current marathon of quotes by him, uh, I've been saying in each video, I'm not interested in his uh, so-called kind of rebirthing kind of thing or You know, regress to that time your birth trauma and feel the scream and all this. Um, so I'm not interested in that technique, but but um, but um, he he's got some excellent material. That's the funny thing about him. And he said he tried psychoanalysis, and uh, he thinks it doesn't really. Uh, it's not enough to bring up the feelings, but that's. Uh, but but uh, but contrary to that. I'm sticking with, with the, the, the main traditional idea that yes, we need theories, we need ideas, we need maybe these quotes, ballpark approximations. So these are not perfect answers. These are speculations, hypotheses, trying to be a detective, trying to, trying to raise consciousness. Maybe some ideas linked to some ahas, you know, maybe some ideas uh, just percolate and then it leads to emotional knowing. But you kind of need the ideas to feel safe by then the feeling may come in so I'm sort of going I'm sort of going on that premise that most the, the main the main kind of psychoanalytic perspective raise consciousness so yes look for interpretations look for patterns look for links um, could this be a symbol of that or is this a repetition of that are we trying to bring that into the present what happened in the past are we trying to get something are we trying to get an old unmet need uh, from the past with somebody in the present Standing as a stand-in for somebody in the power. We look at this, these kinds of transference and repetition compulsion and then negative magic gesture, identification with the aggressor. Are we treating others the way our mother treated us for us to know how our mother treated us? Like have some kind of theories like this. Right, whoops. Oh, there's the charity's buddy there. So we, we might get a, an appearance later on from uh, He's a bit of a celebrity of the, the swan, there, so I don't see him at the moment. But each time I've been here, he's, he's made an appearance, so let's see if he... Uh... Yeah, they've got some carp in there. Yeah, I don't think you can see it. And um, yeah, that's his buddy over there. Now, once in a while, Charlie uh, flaps his wings. It's kind of cool, you know. Nice little venue here. Uh, I can only... The only ch if I'm able to use this place, it'll only be during the week, mid-afternoon, like now, like around three o'clock. Uh, nights, forget it. Weekends, forget it. Uh, and if there's some kind of special function, yeah, forget it. So this is the only kind of rare time. It's got a, a cool little venue, yeah. Lights up at night, and uh, two floors, yeah. They got a peacock, some some rabbits for the kids in the back area. And luckily, uh, yeah, they stay, there's, there's sprinkling of guests in the afternoon. So this is Monday afternoon, so this is great, yeah. Yeah, we've done some good videos here. I, 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 we've done a few good videos here. I think a seven was good. 2747 was a good video. I was, I was feeling very, uh, rested and energized. I, I thought I, my delivery was not bad during that time. Okay, so the, the image for this is psychoanalysis looks for an egg in a basket that's missing. So first, find this basket, like a level of safety, a level of ideas. It's kind of like holding you, you know, like if you have that kind of capacity to accept your feelings that's like a basket so if you're if you're safe to yourself then your old feelings from the bag you know might come up to you kind of thing so in the basket there's an egg in the egg is the firebird the firebird when the firebird cracks out uh, the image in missing fairy tales is that the protagonist rides on hops on the back of the firebird and rides the firebird up that's a metaphor for you getting back to your feelings, the emotional knowing. But first, there had to be a basket to hold the egg. Janov says, oh, forget the basket. Um, just bypass the basket, do your breathing exercise, and get back your feelings. I, I don't think so. 
Uh, it, uh, maybe for some people, they already had a strong ego. So maybe it worked okay. They would have done it with anybody anyway. So it would have happened anyways because they had a strong ego. They just needed like a little moment of safety uh, to let that happen kind of thing. Um, but for a lot of people, maybe it's overwhelming. They would shut down. They couldn't do it. Or, um, but he spent his whole life on it and uh, you know, updated it again and again. But you know, whatever, whatever, um, whatever it is about uh, the technique, um, he shared a lot of focus and interest about the brain's response to trauma. So he's making us look inward, and he's focusing on a, a, a hugely neglected area called prenatal trauma. So he talks a lot about prenatal trauma, and one of his main theories is that in the, if there's prenatal trauma, like the baby's in the uterus, and uh, he's overwhelmed by something, mother smoking, uh, mother drinking, mother arguing, mother upset, so much stress going on, and he's kind of freaking out, uh, maybe feeling overwhelmed. Well, he may go through life with a constant sense of always being overwhelmed. So, so he says people who are very irritable and fly off the handle easily, easily triggered, that's because maybe they got too much cortisol from the mother while they were in the uterus. It kind of creates what he calls a prototypic trauma, and then with it, a prototypic response. So the baby had an original trauma and an original response. Original trauma, original response. That became a primary circuit. So later on, if there are stresses in life, it may trigger that primary circuit. So if the baby felt overwhelmed in the uterus, if in life, something, too much pressure, um, they may have that strong feeling um, being so overwhelmed. Uh, so a little thing is minor, but they might feel so overwhelmed, like they felt overwhelmed in the uterus. So they transit the past into the present, because in the past there's no time. So from the trauma, from the brainstem's point of view, all time is that time. But there is time, but the, but the trauma mind doesn't understand time. So we transit the past into the present, uh, because it's still the past from the emotional point of view. So we have to look at this uh, theory like this. So um, let's, uh, let's, let's uh, pick up on this point a little bit. Yeah, one sec. Okay, so our very first quote um, about this. One sec. Okay, the initial birth experience may be prototypic of how the child will, will respond to stress later on. The notion of prototypic trauma and prototypic defense. Okay, another way of saying it was... Uh, oh, there's a cute little bird here. Let's see him. Got the blue beak, yeah. And then the update to that was uh, this one here. Look at this one here. Whenever a pain is engraved into the nervous system, the response to that pain is also stamped in. The pain and the response are a unity which becomes prototypic so that under any later stress, the original response pattern is automatically triggered. Okay, so we've done a few, we've done a few examples um, in the first, uh, five videos of this. So some a general one was to, in, the baby in the uterus. There was a lot going on. He had prenatal distress syndrome. Um, he had a hard time in the canal, in the birth canal. The child was freaking out, overwhelmed by things. So he, this person said that they kind of feel that life is overwhelming all the time. It was a pattern, like a prototypic template, blueprint, and he, he carries that all his life. So if in the uterus he felt overwhelmed, he may generally feel overwhelmed in life, or very easily feel overwhelmed by slight stresses. Um, and a variation was a woman had a, was stuck in the canal for a long time, a very long time. She was stuck in the canal. 
Um, and she said, you know, that her, feel, her main feeling in life is that she always feels stuck in things. Like she tries something, she feels stuck. Stuck in a marriage, stuck in a job, stuck in this, stuck. She always had this constant feeling of being stuck. Janoff's interpretation was, you know, yeah. Well, I can see, oh yeah, did you have that kind of nightmare or, or something like that? You were stuck in the canal? Well, she reported in her visualization that she was, she felt stuck in the canal or something. I don't know if that really happens, but that, that's, he claims it does. Um, um, the, the, uh, another one, uh, another one was, um, uh, the endorphins, so the, um, the baby was trying to come out of the canal, he was doing his thing. Um, and suddenly the mother took massive anesthesia and endorphins and painkillers and all this. And he said that in his life, it, it's a kind of a pattern. He tries to do something and then wolf, he gives up, he blanks out. He gives up easily. He tries to learn some new skill, he tries a little bit. He just said, oh, I don't know, I have daydreams, I can't do it, forget it. That was, so that the prototype was, he was doing his thing, coming out of the canal, do, you know, wanting to progress and develop and grow and, <laughs> right, advance, forward, you know, that kind of thing. And then the mother took massive an anesthesia. It goes to the child. That's the thing, Janoff emphasizes, uh, don't believe this placenta barrier too much. A lot of what the mother does, goes to the child. So those uh, painkillers, whatever, that the mother took uh, during delivery, it went into the child's brain and he was whooshed, like like strongly. Mother just uh, got a mild numbing or something, but for the baby, he went like deeply uh, blanked out or something. So that's a deep imprint, a primary circuit. So the pattern was, right, so the pattern was set. Tried to do something and woof, what happens in his brain? That's a circuit. It can be triggered uh, later on when he tries to do something for himself, learn something, and then suddenly, instantly, the brain releases a massive amount of endorphins flooding him with uh, blanking him out kind of thing. So he would just give up. I don't know, I, I can't do it. Um, the example was he was trying to bake bread or something. He was following the instructions on the bread machine. He got frustrated. Oh, I can't I give I can't do it. He tried another hobby. Oh, I can't do it. And he had this, and this was a constant pattern where he always gave up easily. He would try something, give up easily. Um, so the prototype Janeth was saying was maybe something like that. That, the, at the, that as he was progressing, whoosh, uh, the, mother, the mother flooded the baby's brain uh, with, all, with all those painkillers or whatever. And it flooded him, he blanked out his space land or whatever. Oh, there he is. Hey. All right, there, there's Charlie. Am I holding the camera? Okay, sometimes I'm missing it, right? Is that right? Okay. Now wait till he turns around, yeah. Not two nice birds, yeah. Maternal symbols, yeah. It's a, like a mother goose too. Maternal symbols, man. Um, okay, so we've had uh, a couple of other examples. So the overwhelmed, feeling overwhelmed, feeling stuck, uh, quits easily. Um, another pattern that uh, he talked about was uh, there's meant to be a kind of a rhythm uh, between the baby and the mother, kind of a rapport there somehow, back and forth that goes on. But if, if the mother's out of touch with her body, you know, she's and she's kind of missing the signals of the baby. It's like the baby's trying to communicate with the mother, but the mother's not getting it, gaslighting the baby. Uh, so that person uh, found that as a pattern in their life. They found that as a pattern in their life, they felt like that original template, that they were trying to communicate, they weren't being heard, and there was a problem there. Now the child wanted to be heard by the mother, 
so that there can be a proper rhythm so he can go through the canal properly. Uh, he wants to like go through the canal properly. So in the present, he found himself talking to people and uh, I don't know how he created it or maybe chose people in advance who are passive aggressive or who are in a bad mood or, or who are thinking about other things. So they recreated that dynamic where, geez, I'm not getting through to you, am I? I'm trying to communicate here. I'm pretty clear here. You, you seem to not get what I'm saying here. I'm not getting through to you. His hope was, if the person, oh, they're all right, yeah, that's, that's nice, yeah. Oh, he's right. Oh, he's right there. Is he? Well, somebody's in a boat here. Oh, hi. <laughs> Charlie, do you want to say something to your fans? What's on your mind? What, what's going on? What are you thinking about? I'm not getting through to you, am I? Talk to me. <laughs> So the, the person would say, they would, they would find themselves talking to people and they, they had this constant phenomenon of feeling that, the, that they're never, that they feel like they can't make themselves clear enough maybe, or they're not getting it. So that, that was the pattern. And he even said, geez, I wish I can get through to you. Um, if you understand me, can I get through to you, then maybe that's a symbol that in the uterus he wanted his mother to understand him so he can go through the canal. Just an accidental play on words there a little bit. And for more on this rhythm pulse, for more on the rhythm issue, go to TQ 27 of 45. One, two, three, the fifth quote, the, the long one. That's a good one about the rhythm. Um, another pattern, let's see. Okay, a traumatic birth leaves us vulnerable to even the slightest stress later on. Okay, so if somebody's irritable, right, they're always in a heightened alert state. That came from the uterus, right? Okay, we, okay to tackle a problem and then wants to give up right away. So there's a guy that always gives up right away. The feeling of defeat has happened when her mother received massive an anesthesia at birth, which entered into the birthing child. Um, okay, there was an another example was uh, the cord was twisted around. Um, one kid had the cord twisted around him and he was in a panic. The mother went to a heavy metal concert. The loud noises startled him, and he was kicking around, and he wasn't getting enough oxygen, the cord, and he was kicking around trying to unravel the cord. It was getting worse and worse. Finally, the child decided, he froze up, I can't kick anymore. Oh my God. So he felt, I can't make a move here. The, the cord was so twisted around him, uh, he was totally immobilized like this. So there were, oh. What's that? That's a kind of an odd. What's he doing? Eh? Really? Okay. <laughs> just a tiny little, just a tiny little man-made pond there. And the, the guy, the guy's in the, the guy's in the boat. <laughs> um, yeah, the the, the cord was. Um, um, the, the cord was twisted around the, the baby and it, to the point where the, the baby knew it that he couldn't dare make another move and he was stuck like that he was afraid to make a move he said that was a pattern in his life that always through life he always felt like that whatever he was in or doing 
Yeah, I always felt like I better not make a move here. Now that's neurotic because you're applying something from that's Janoff's definition of neurosis and other people as well to apply an outdated mechanism and apply that to the present, but the present is in the past. So for example, if he had a job that he didn't like, he said, I better not move here. Stay, don't don't go, don't do anything, just don't, don't move. That's neurotic. Of course he can leave the job if he's miserable there, right? But he felt, no, I can't move. He always had this kind of thing, right? Yeah, let's say he's at a cocktail party talking to somebody and he's eager to leave the person or something. So he triggers he triggers the, temp, the primary circuit. The primary circuit said, well, you learned it that when you're under stress, don't move. Now you feel stressed, don't move. So he would stay there talking to the guy, afraid to make a move kind of thing. So this is one of Janoff's theories that we create some kind of primary circuit. And it was useful, of course, at that time. Right? The baby was right to not move, make a move. But to apply that throughout life, that's neurotic. It's lived. It's it's lived. It's use. It's outlived its usefulness. Um, another uh, dramatic example was uh, the, the asthma kid. Now this one always really kind of. Let's 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 pick up that one again about the asthma. There was a kid who had a really hard a really hard time in uterus, to the point where he had to constrict his bronchioles. Um, oh, let's just read the property here. Hold on a sec. Where's the bronchioles one? Oh, yeah, here, here. Okay, congestion by fluids during a protracted labor and birth could cause the neonate to reflexively constrict his bronchioles in order to save his life. Right? So, there was, he's in the amniotic sac. There's so much stress going on. It got to the point where the baby inside had to tighten and constrict his bronchioles. Like he was holding his breath or something. I guess something like that, right? That experience becomes frozen in time in the form of a primary memory circuit so that any later stress which is life endangering or is interpreted as life threatening for example an argument between one's parents which portends divorce will automatically set off the prototypic trauma and its defense of constricted bronchioles. The result may be an asthmatic attack. Instead of the person being saved by this defense, as it was at birth, they are now in danger. For example, what if he doesn't have his puffer, right? This in, ens this in essence is neurosis, a defense that has outlived its function. The asthma occurs because the parents' argument sets off the original primal trauma at birth. So that, that's, that says directly that's a, a direct and vivid a, an example of neurosis. The baby survived to constrict his bronchioles uh, uh, when he was in the other oh, so. But later in life, if it was a stress, you know, he thought his parents might divorce. Uh, that'd be a lot, that'd be that'd be a very stressful thing. The mother has to work, and the father's not around. He's going to be home alone. That's pretty stressful. That stress triggered the first time he was under stress. And what did what did he do the first time he was under stress? He constricted his bronchioles. But that was when he was in the amniotic sac. But he did that in the present and had an asthma attack, and that's. 
neurotic because the present isn't the past, and it's dangerous because mate, what if you didn't have this puffer in the present? So he, he's he. So every time this kid felt stress, he had to run for the puffer. So he was reliving the original prenatal distress syndrome, prenatal trauma scenario, where he had a near-death experience in the uterus. So in the present, under stress, he hasn't, he can't breathe anymore because he's reliving that thing in the past. Um, okay, uh, there might be a couple of, I think there's one or two other examples sort of in, in that area here. Well, that's today's quote, so hold on, hold on. Yeah, so in trauma, he may shut down his feeling center and it's stuck like that. And then he doesn't feel himself and others. Okay. Um, the, tr the prenatal trauma may be caused by smoking because this, the, 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 the tobacco constricts uh, the blood vein in the cord which sends oxygen to the baby. So if that vein is constricted, it can't receive too much enough oxygen. Plus, uh, the mother has to use her oxygen to deal with the tar and the nicotine, leaving less oxygen available for the baby. Plus, the baby doesn't have much of a, uh, a vein to receive much oxygen as well. So smoking uh, is harmful for the baby. Caffeine, alcohol, etc. These are all harmful for the baby. All right, there's the one about not moving. Yeah. When asked why he stayed in this uh, organization, uh, which he knew was hurtful to him, he answered uh, that he unconsciously thought that to make a move could be dangerous. So he remembered that in the uterus, he was strangled by the umbilical cord. And in that time in the uterus, uh, when the umbilical cord was strangling him, he couldn't make a move at that time. So, not to make any move in general meant safety. That was his prototype. Not to make any move meant safety originally. My guess is that most people who smoke or drink never... Okay, that's another one. Hang on. Okay, I think there's one or two others um, in here somewhere, but... Uh... Oh, this is... One. Okay, yeah, like anxiety. Okay. Oh, here's a similar one where she flew off the handle. So a, a, a variation on the theme was she was stressed out in the uterus and the husband said, oh, the bus is leaving in 10 minutes, darling. Yeah, can we, let's go catch the bus. Oh, you're, I feel overwhelmed. You're stressing me out here, back off. So the prototype was she had a hard time in the uterus, very stressed, a lot of pressure, a lot of expectation, a lot of pressure. So later on, if there's like a little pressure, the husband says, come on, the bus is, we're gonna be late. Pressure, back off, you, you, leave without me. That kind of thing. A high level of anxiety in the mother will constrict sorry, will contribute to stress for the unborn child. An anxious pregnant mother responding to her outer world is stirring up the metabolism of her unborn child who is also responding to his environment. If the mother's anxiety goes on long enough, it will become a permanent state and will change her child for life. The mother's anxiety will overstimulate the baby 
and impair their nervous system, creating a child with an imprint of a high level of stimulation, which could leave her feeling overwhelmed by every little thing that happens throughout life. As an adult, she might respond to her husband's request to, to pass the potatoes or uh, bring the salt to the table with an angry, oh, do I have to do everything? Get it yourself. The outside dictates the inside. For the unborn child, the mother's womb is the external world. The womb environment that keeps, um, that keeps them in, a, in an alert state eventually becomes part of the baby who will become more aggressive, hyperactive, and who cannot sit still. So the baby's born with a revved up body and the set points are elevated or something where the lack of love elevated the point of an increased demand for more endorphins. Okay. So stress. Uh, so the, the baby, if the baby's loved, he gets a proper wiring, right? A steady, normal wiring uh, of proper brain chemistry, right? In trauma, that gets damaged, so he's flooded with, uh, now he's flooded with cortisol. So the baby comes out with PTSD, basically, very irritable and easily angry, like a curmudgeon or gr grunge or grumpy kind of person, right? So the baby can come out of the womb with PTSD, in other words. Okay, so that's, that's part one, right? That, that, that a prototype of uh, stress response, a primary circuit is established and later stresses can trigger it and that's called neurosis because we're still living in the past, reacting to the present as if it's something that we're in the past. Okay. So this issue of this set timeless loop that's going on, it's because the baby's knees didn't get met. So, baby's born. Uh, so let's just, let's not go, you know what, in the last video, I think I tried to spend some time on describing some of the basic needs that the baby has. So can I refer you to the last video? Um, uh, done with the, the it looked like um, I'm on a starship with the, with the star, uh, there were lights on the ceiling of the building. It was a circular uh, structure there. It kind of looked like I was in a spaceship. That one there lost. <laughs> I was in a restaurant yesterday. Um, and there's like a curvature, like a circular structure on the roof. And they put, and they have these little dip lights all around. And it had the effect that it looked like you're on a spaceship and those are the stars out the window. Anyways, that one there, 49. 49. Yeah, 27.49. I kind of went through the baby's needs um, in the uterus at birth, four to five months, four to, five, four to five months, 18 months, 18 months, 36 months, those kind of developmental kind of needs. Uh, that took me about an hour to go through, so let's maybe not do it here this time. But, um, but let's just, in, in short, say that the baby needs mother's love, right? Keep it simple. Maternal supplies feeling of safe, her reverie, her attunement, her soothing, etc. So a baby needed like paradise in the uterus, um, the, an extended paradise, skin to skin, breastfeeding, loving gaze, and so on and so forth. So the baby needed, um, had, the, had these uh, needs for mother's love um, for his uh, identity. I feel that for I am, Um, now that for the emerging identity, the baby has needs. So F and N, feelings and needs, and so in general, if the, if the needs are met for his identity, he'll feel pleasant. If the needs for his identity, emerging self, 
an arm met, you'll feel distressed and all that. So the baby's the baby at some point, either in the uterus or being born or shortly afterwards. Mother, uh, I need fill in the blank, right? And she's missing too and malo too, not around, in a bad mood, not available. Didn't want to be a mother, or wanted to use the baby. She got a she she had she was traumatized herself with it, and she's repeating her trauma with her mother uh, in a process of repetition compulsion. So she's bogged down with with a, not receiving enough love herself to be a loving mother for her baby. So whatever's going on with the mother, if the baby's needs don't get met. Okay? So that's for his identity, his emerging self. If the needs are met, that's the golden ball, the feelings. So first the baby will say, Mother, uh, hi there, I need a connection with you, I need a secure, a secure attachment style with you. Okay, so we're talking about attachment trauma here. So assuming the, there's no prenatal trauma, assuming the no birth trauma, when he comes out, he needs a secure attachment style. Mother, I need a secure attachment style with you. If it's not there, uh, he'll be upset, feelings and needs. F and N, feelings and needs. The needs were for a secure attachment style, secure attachment style. If that's not met, he'll cry and scream and all this, right? So F and N, he's screaming, he's in pain, he's angry, he's scared, he's screaming, first control anxiety, uh, abandonment depression, he's just he's screen painting basically, right? So then the mother can say, oh, you're showing me your feelings as a signal that your needs aren't being met. Thank you, baby. Let me change and provide what you need. So everything's okay. But if the needs are met and the baby's expressing his feelings around it, and then the mother says, what are you crying about? And gaslights the baby, or unavailable, or ignores it or something, puts the baby in a crib and lets the baby cry, and, oh, that, that'll traumatize him. The baby needs skin-to-skin -skin contact for four to five months. The mother puts the baby in a crib, lets him cry at night. He's, okay, oh, nice. That's trauma. That's trauma. His whole inner life freezes, petrifies. He'll fall numb inside. He'll be angry, all frozen up. And then he spends the rest of his life chasing for his symbolic mother. So, so while the trauma is taking place, um, Janoff describes it as there being, um, or coming into a place uh, an electrochemical neon flashing light in the system somewhere telling the person flashing like an emergency red alert yeah. unlove 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 beep beep like so when the baby's knees don't get that he's in a state of timelessness no time infinite all time it's just now all the time there's no time there's no past or future it's just he was unloved, so he's always unloved. Because all time is that time. There's, there's no concept of time. So it's just flashing endlessly. Okay? Unloved, unloved, unloved. Okay, now, now you can imagine uh, a baby free screaming, but it's frozen, and it's voiceless. Voiceless, frozen scream. But the baby's screaming in pain. Take a photo, like imagine a picture like that. But it's alive. And there's a flashing neon light, unloved, 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 and the baby's crying, but you can't hear it. They can't, can't hear it. It's frozen, but it's, uh, but it's going on. Hence, unloved, un. So he's, there's a constant scream going on. It's frozen, but he's still screaming. But it's voiceless, but he's still screaming in a timelessness. So the sign kind of adds to that. So while that's taking place, okay, this, that's a pain so utter. Okay, that's so much pain. The brain's gonna do a mercy thing. It's gonna release endorphins, the painkiller, right? The natural endorphins for the baby. So it'll be like a whoosh of a, like an umbrella sponge of numbing endorphins. It's gonna put him in a trance. He's gonna like, like sleepwalk through life kind of thing. So he'll be numb in life basically. You know? So that's sort of a, maybe like a, an image we can uh, experiment with, right? So a baby screaming, but no sound, but he's screaming. Like the screen painting, so the front cover of Janoff's first book was that Edward Munch screen painting, right? The primal screen painting. So, but imagine the baby doing it, not like a full. Right? Imagine a baby kind of screaming, stuck like that. Unloved, unloved. That's constant pain. It's endless pain, right? There's a pain so utter. 
Okay? And then the person goes in a swoon to not feel the pain, but the pain is still there. And it's going on like that. Now this is recorded in the brainstem. Okay? So we have three brains, right? Everybody knows this. The tri tri three part brain. We have three brains, right? Based on evolution, they said the limbic system one, um, like like the stem one. He always talks about it. He always he always uses the salamander image for the brainstem, because the salamander, he said, um, like the whole thing is like a brainstem. So that's like part of us, right? Like the earliest from billions of years ago, whatever it was. And then evolution, we grew, we layered on top of it. Uh, the limbic system, the feeling, like the monkey brain and all this, right? And dogs and pets and animals and all that, right? So feelings are there. So it's, before it was sensations, then it's the feelings. And then later on, uh, 100,000 years ago, we grew the cortex, the third brain, the neocortex, with the language and all this. So we got the three brains, right? So first it's recorded in that uh, brainstem area, in that automatic reactivity, survival mind, right? So, oh yeah, I just saw a humorous clip this morning. Uh, somebody took a bunch of. Okay, never mind. Um, if you, if you took a bunch of uh, reptiles or something, and they and they made it. <laughs> it was it was sort of a, it was an ironic reference to the three parts of the brain. That's why I kind of reminded of it, but it's it's too. It needs more explanation if I'm going to include that one. So, um, it, it's recorded in, in the, let's just say the brain stem, right? The salamander brain, the lizard brain or whatever. It's recorded in there. Now what's recorded in there? What's the primary circuit? Okay, the cry for love. Unloved, unloved, mother didn't love me. I need, I, ha I have those needs. She didn't meet them. That's a pain, unloved, pain, Endorphins, swoon. So he didn't get the love. Now enter repetition compulsion. When there's trauma, we repeat to see if we can get it. So, so the baby didn't get mother's love. Try again, kind of thing. The pain says try again. You got to get mother's love. Okay. So that's early on in the beginning. And if mother is constantly misattuned, constantly malattuned, constantly soul blind, the mother's soul blind to the baby's uh, feelings and needs and personhood and so on, that's gonna happen, huh? And if this goes on like this, then, he, then, he, then the, the mammal brain kind of develops in. There's your feelings about it. And then uh, the cortex uh, develops in. So that loop thing, it's gonna be transferred into those other brains. So finally it goes to the cortex. So now the cortex has this loop from the past. Now in the past, the baby was looking for mother's breast, skin-to-skin uh, -skin contact, mother's loving gaze. Okay, so the baby needed a secure paradise with the mother. Skin-to-skin -skin contact, because that's the emotional communication through the skin-to-skin, -skin, the, the, like body-to-body, -body, Huh? And the skin is like a bridge for the emotions of the two to go back and forth. That allows the child a level of safety and warmth to feel safe enough to know himself as separate, as distinct from the mother, psychologically. That was failed, right? And then if that's failed, he identifies with the aggressor, very angry about it. He's stuck there in it, what's called adhesive identification, like a glue there. So the baby and the mother are one. If, he's, if he feels safe and loved, he can separate. The skin to skin will facilitate that. The breastfeeding will facilitate because the nerve lines and the loving gaze will facilitate it. So all that maternalness um, is missing. So, um, so um, that looped memory of originally the baby looking for a mother's breast, skin to skin, loving gaze, that's all missing. As the as the baby gets older and the cortex comes the, the cortex comes online, right? That gets channeled into there. So in the present, we're still doing the loop, but in the present, it can only be symbolic of the past, and our symbolic chasing in the present, we're not even aware that it's symbolic of what? We're not even aware that it's symbolic. 
let alone of what? So in the present, we go through life chasing symbolic mother's love, symbolic breast, symbolic um, maternal goodness and all. We're chasing it symbolically. So now, you, now it's relentless, it's greed, okay? um, you know, disappointment. Now you're still in the state of narcissism, so it's relentless entitlement, relentless uh, hope, relentless outrage, relentless... Okay? Uh, so Martha Stark discusses this in, in her thing about relentlessness. So it's the repetition compulsion. When it's trauma, we repeat to still try to get it. But when we get older, it's only going to be symbolic of the past. There is time. The present isn't the past. The present isn't the nursery. So what are they going to search for? Or well, something that reminds them of the mother and have the hope that if they get it, it'll be the proper love mother experience that was needed back then in the nursery. So in other words, they repeat the past and the present, hoping to magically get their needs met from the past. It's nonsense. That's, that's why it's called neurosis. Transferring the past, problem into the present, hoping to undo the past, change the past. So we need to be aware of this. Um, that's, that's narrative medicine. We know what's going on. Okay, now we have some identity by that knowledge. And then we can mourn the loss. So the goal is to mourn it. But to mourn it, you need story medicine. And that's what these 10,000 quotes are about, to give us some story medicine. I believe these 10,000 quotes um, to be uh, clear and helpful and um, not, not too obscure, nothing like that. And um, most of them are written by the shrinks, you know, or psychologically minded therapists. Um, so there's, there's no convoluted philosophy. Uh, there's no Lacan and Jung and these guys. And, even Adler, not too much, uh, and, and like Bion and these kind of names. We don't really have those kind of... There's no Freud because of the convoluted English translation. So it's, it's clear, it's people who write clearly. What I'm trying to say, this is all by people who write clearly and make sense to some degree. Um, now, of course, I can't guarantee everything is accurate. So Robert Bly says, 30% of what you're going about to hear tonight in, 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 so when he has a, when he delivers a lecture in an auditorium, sometimes he prefaces the lecture with, dear audience members, thanks for coming out here tonight. I'm gonna to give you a psychological interpretation of a Grimm's tale. 30% of what you're gonna to hear tonight is wrong. It's up to you, dear audience, to figure out which 30%. So I've been applying that throughout. Um, now with John, with Janoff's material, it's more like 50%. So dear anybody who might be watching or listening, 50% of what you're hearing, 50% is going to be wrong. You got to figure out which 50%. Because this is this is deeper stuff. This is uh, more emotionally. This this is much more emotional material. He's he mainly focuses on prenatal trauma. That's why. So yeah, he found a real niche uh, in that area. I give him credit uh, for that for bringing this to our attention. I think his stuff is helpful. Um, his his writing is helpful. He spends a lot of time grooming himself and keeping himself clean and all this. <laughs> uh oh, I hope that's not copyrighted. Can you hear the music in the background? Oh yeah, their um, their, their coffee machine's broken, so I'm about I'm drinking a tea instead. Yeah. See, it might not see me as caffeine. So yeah, you won't see ca this. This will be a rare uncaffeinated video. Usually, I have one coffee, it makes me a little peppy. Um, so I'm just going on tea this time. Yeah, a local kind of a gingery kind of tea kind of thing. Let's see, what is it? Where's it um,
Oh, I can't even see it here. Want to see the label? Oh, it doesn't even see it on here. Oh, okay, just a tab. Okay. Um, if you can find it, uh, there's a very good tea called Egypt Egyptian Licorice Mint by the Yogi Tea Company from Oregon. Egyptian, they also have licorice mint, not that one. Uh, specifically that flavor, Egyptian Licorice Mint. What a great tea. Um, I haven't seen it, I haven't had it in a long time, but... Uh, Anyways, hold on a sec. Yeah. It's thirty three where I am, but with the heat index, it's thirty eight, they said. And no breeze, so that's why you're seeing me sweating a little bit. Okay, so that, that's, that's um, part two, right? So part one, the prototype is set in, the primary circuit is set in, and in the present, um, we replay and reuse that primary defense from the first primary pain, and something in the present sets it off. Okay, part two, that gets shifted into the cortex, and then we're chasing uh, symbolic mother to get out of this problem. So we're searching for symbols of mother. Okay. So um, now this uh, loop phenomenon is called repetition compulsion. So we uh, search for the love. So everything's love or a cry for love. So we're searching for the cry for love. Now in the last video, there are different ways to cry for this love. That's the, that's the key here. So I, I don't want to redo it here, but if you go to the last video, uh, I went through the two main ways, the singer and the clinger way. So there's a more disturbed way of crying for love. The more disturbed way is you make others do it. Like, like others stand in as a proxy for you and you play the shaming mother. Let them cry for you and they're crying you're crying, but you don't want to feel it, so you play the shaming mother, find some innocent other to play you, and you shame them to replay how the mother shamed you, and that's how, that's your, that's how you're replaying that cycle. Mother shamed the baby, okay? So in the present, they don't want to, like, shame them, like, they don't want to, how do they recreate that? Like, how do they reorchestrate that? Um, they don't want to, like, well, there's two ways in the new situation to replay that cry for love. The more benign way is they play themselves and ask others to give them the love. It's disappointing, yeah, ouch, but you know, you can handle it kind of thing. Now the more disturbed way, the more traumatized way, uh, when trauma takes place very early on, before 18 months, they don't play themselves. They play the shame you rather find someone else to be disappointed. But they are still disappointed. The mechanism is known as projection. So they're, they're shamed, unloved self. They see onto others. They pay the shaming mother who shames them. Remember, it's fusion. Self and other are fused. So the, so the original is mother shamed them. But in the brain, in the child's understanding, is there's no differentiation between himself and the mother. So mother shamed him, but it's all blurred up. New situation. He plays the shaming mother who shames himself. Too painful so he sees himself outwardly so the behavior is he's going to shame others to replay the record of mother shaming him the more benign version if there's trauma post 18 months they play themselves and just expect others to reject them and they can orchestrate and make it happen and we discussed that in the last video right so that's the stinger way and the clinger way the, the stinger way is considered a more perverse more psychotic more harmful more hurtful and all this the clinger way is more benign foolish and childlike and all this, but, and we talked about that, that distinction. So everything's a love or a cry for love? Oh, that's a famous song in the background. Oh, that'll be copyrighted for sure. 
Hopefully you're not hearing it now. Our famous pops. Yeah, she passed away, what, two years ago, right? Miss Turner. I gotta get a breeze here. Hold on a sec. Let me take a stretch here. There's no, there's no breeze around here today. Copyright, copyright, no, no, no. I can't, I can't. Now the idea that something can be symbolic of mother, cookies, food, stimulating fluid, gum, right? material, matter, money. So you're searching for things relentlessly, hoping that the thing you get in the present, now there's greed's gonna come from there, of course. Or it can if the trauma is before 18 months, yeah. If the trauma is before 18 months, greed is gonna be there. Envy's gonna be there. Okay, infantile yardstick. They're looking at this perfect or nothing kind of thing. Uh, they need the they need the paradise of oppressed experience with the mother, so nothing to do it. Uh, outrage, uh, endless outrage, endless entitlement, endless grievance collecting. And they're kinda in this loop greed, envy, greed loop called Renvy, uh, and so on. So now their identity is that once upon a time they were on the throne in the uterus. So they're always searching for this fame, prestige, kind of glory. So cynicism will gratify them. Uh, negative humor on, onto others will gratify them. Uh, it's this, it's the superiority complex of, uh, of a kind of a pseudo self-sufficiency, uh, pseudo self-sufficiency, because the baby thought he was just God, and so that's the pseudo self-sufficiency. And yesterday we talked about the in the hotel the, the models were on the TV screen, walking around like they own everything. Cold and I don't need anybody. I don't need you. I'm, I'm self-sufficient. I'm superior. Like they were kind of giving off that air quality about them. And the voyeur and the people may be voyeuristic about it. And they're the exhibitionists. We talk about that. Nothing in the present you get. Him can be the needed good breast experience that we needed back in the nursery. So it never works, so you keep repeating it, it's like a loop like that. Now we keep repeating until we become conscious of this. Then we can stop repeating. But until then, we're gonna keep repeating. So let's, um, okay, hold on a sec. So the unconscious hope, the unconscious hope of fulfillment of old unfulfilled needs, okay? So we have this unconscious hope of fulfillment of old unfulfilled needs. You see? We never got and will never get what we needed as a child. So the death of this unreal hope is the birth of life. Pain makes us honest with oneself while it does away with unreal belief systems. Okay, let's, let's go back to the symbolic point a bit here. Hold on a sec.
Okay, love outside the critical period. Yeah, see, love outside the critical, that's a critical period. The baby needs love during the first three years. If that's missing, nothing later on can satisfy that. Later on, it's only symbolic of it. It's not real. It's just a metaphor of it. It's not real. But you have the hope that the metaphor can be real. That's called relentless hope. It doesn't work. But the hope is that you're going to get it, that you're chasing something. And the hope gives you that one day you're going to get it. That hope, uh, that promise. See, the baby, when the baby comes out, Mother, are you... There's a promise on the baby's end that the mother's going to be there. Mother fails, but the promise keeps the baby going, right? The hope keeps the baby going. Love outside the critical period. Oh yeah, Janoff's example, uh, like with a lot of people use Mar Mar Marilyn Monroe as an example. She didn't get the first proper love during the critical first three years, right? And then no matter how much fame and adulation and admiration from millions of people it doesn't it doesn't matter it's all symbolic it's not the real thing nothing in the present can uh, correct that you get post that critical period can change and undo that deep uh, imprint that deep primary circuit you get, you're only searching for imaginings of that it never corrects it so Marilyn Monroe is a is a vivid example of this she, she got all this fame and glory it didn't change that past Love outside the critical period cannot make permanent changes in the, neuro, in the neurobiological system. Then the person becomes addicted to substitute uh, fulfillment. Breastfeeding is an absolute essential for a healthy child. If we don't get it when we need it, we can spend a lifetime looking for symbols of mother's uh, breasts in a vain attempt at unconscious fulfillment. Right? So any symbol, anything in the present, many things in the present can be symbolic of the mother. Now the first mother, that's why I said breast, the first mother for the baby is the breast mother. Baby doesn't see the mother like as a full person. He's only mainly relating relating in a kind of utilitarian way with the, with the breast mother. So if the baby doesn't get the breast mother experience, they're still searching for it. Now in the brainstem, it's literal, right? The actual breast mother. But when it shifts to the cortex, it's just symbolic of the past. It's not very fair that a trauma which lasts perhaps a few minutes or a few hours at the beginning of life can make us so neurotic for life. That's why care of the unborn child and infant is so important. Feelings are us. This is the ultimate meaning of finding yourself. If we discover we were unloved, we are finding our true self. The aim of therapy is to give the client back her real self. Now let's just stick with the symbol here. Hold on. One of the symbols, uh, one of the symbols of mother's love, can be the hope for it, the promise for it, not just cookies and uh, alcohol and cigarettes and things like that. Uh, and, okay, so there can be like the belief. A belief can be a, a synonymous, or an idea can be synonymous um, with uh, the hope for mother's love. So um, hang on, let's, before we do that one, let's see. My guess is that most people who smoke or drink never really realize the connection between pain and their habits. Neurosis is a paradox. It is enormously strong, a force that one acts on every day, yet a force that eludes us. Yeah, so the person is taking the drink, symbolic, fl okay, stimulating fluid. They have no idea that it's a symbol of the original stimulating breast milk fluid that was missing. They don't make that link. 
That's the power of neurosis to make us unaware of that. So the belief that uh, the glass of wine or something can be the, the soothing from the mother of the past, that belief, it's like a hope or a belief or a hope for that. And that has the effect of releasing endorphins. Because the trigger is, baby was disappointed, he got endorphins. You recreate the disappointment, you get endorphins. Get it? Okay. So, the prototype is the baby was in pain, he got endorphins. Pain, endorphins. Okay? So, Emily Dickinson, there's a pain so utter, it swallows substance up, and one goes in a swoon. The swoon is the endorphins. So, you recreate that. The glass of wine is not mother's milk. So you trigger the disappointment. You replay the disappointment. The, the wine is not mother's milk. You thought it, you thought in your symbol, in your symbolism, maybe it could be. So you're gonna be disappointed. So you trigger the original disappointment, then you get the endorphins. You see? Yeah, I, I think, I think, uh, hopefully, hopefully that one went through, got through there. And this transition of symbolizing uh, what we're looking for, to see how, to see how when feelings are blocked and rerouted, they turn into defensive ideas, beliefs are systems, maps, something to help us navigate life more efficiently. They must, uh, they respond to an almost universal hardwired need. It is not that we need to believe, we believe because we need the beliefs as defenses. These ideas have a dual role, to reflect previous experience and at the same time to mask it. So drinking the glass of wine, whatever, or the chocolate ice cream or whatever, okay, it masks it. It reveals it and it masks it. So the belief or the symbol is code for the past. It's like a code, it's an encryption. encryption. The belief or the symbol or well, the metaphor of mother's love, missing mother's love, the hope, the promise that it can be, or the belief system that you will get it. Enter the, the, the cult gurus talked about last time. It, it's a disappointment. You go back to the nursery. Disappointment, endorphins. Disappointment, endorphins. So we've had these experiences. Should we let sleeping dogs lie? Well, we're feeling the pain all the time. On that level, nothing is sleeping. Yeah, here's the key one. The pain goes from primitive processing mechanisms. Okay, that's the brain stem, the first, the salamander brain, the, or the, the lizard brain, whatever. The, 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 the earliest primitive part of the, of the brain, the first brain that we all have, right? Early on. Okay. The pain goes from the primitive processing mechanisms to the neocortex, the, cord the front lobes, the front lobes and all this, forcing the person to seek symbolic fulfillment. You see? Now the symbolic fulfillment can take the form of cookies and ice cream and, and beer and wine and all this, or, or uh, chasing money or whatever. Uh, or another version is beliefs. Beliefs. What do you call it when central truths of an individual are avoided in favor of some belief or theoretical construction? feelings become converted to ideation. Then those ideas are defended because those ideas defend the individual. When we address defensive belief system, we are really addressing feelings, i.e. the pain. So the belief is the code for the pain. 
if your belief system, if, if a person is using a belief system as a defense against pain, you see, then if you question the belief system, it brings up the pain. A loved child has, will have no need to believe in ideologies of full of magic and hope. When childhood developmental needs go unmet, the foundation of a personality that will grasp at a belief later in life is being built. So then you enter the merchants of hope, the self-help cult gurus and most of the religious stuff. Um, again, we're only talking about religion when it's being used as a tool of the plunder system. Comfort foods aren't going to do anything but keep us unaware of reality. Yeah, so the cookies aren't going to change anything. Long before we discover ice cream and cookies to numb the pain of living, our bodies produce endorphins. With early trauma and lack of love, the brain system is constantly in deficit mode of its serotonin in its supplies. It is no wonder that later tranquilizers may be sought to boost those supplies artificially. And some of these counselors, like uh, make you feel good counselors, you know, like they're there now, sort of like so-called supportive therapy. Supportive therapy can become another act out for the client, like Carl Rogers, you know, I like you, you're a good boy. Okay, that, you know, just still trying to be a parent, saying nice, sweet things to you. Because part, part of that, he's, he was, John was saying, a lot of children never got like a nice dialogue with their parents. The parents are just pedantic or cold or withdrawn or busy or never really had a like a tender communication with them. So if later on, if like a Carl Rogers type of person seems kind of nice and all, you're just drawn to that. And that can be like um, the hope, the symbol. That his kindness it's going to translate to the missing kindness that was needed back in the nursery. It's not going to work, right? So someone like Carl Rogers or something, or some nice, kind speaker or whatever, or friendly kind of speaker, it can be addictive because it's this relentless hope that your fantasy is that it can translate like a cookie to the real love that was needed back then. Yeah, that's what he means. So that kind of therapy. So if that kind of therapy can become another act out for the client who's unconsciously getting what he wants, i.e. symbolic fulfillment instead of what he needs. He needs to feel the lack of fulfillment. He needs to feel not being loved. Not this trick that he's still going to get it. The implication is that you can have good, in, in, you can have good intentions and, and love neurosis away. If all those fail, the therapist refers the client to a doctor who, who uses the more direct means of quelling need and pain by prescribing tranquilizers. A therapist who tries to build a client's self-esteem by telling her, you're, you're, you're really capable, you know, you're awesome, right? Is actually encouraging the client to block out her real feelings of, uh, no, I, I don't feel that way. I feel, I feel shame and bad and no one loves me. Okay. By trying to, you know, love pain away like, by being nice quote unquote like, so don't be nice be real right? uh, what self help book is called by trying to you know say nice things um, by being nice all the time the therapist is fighting reality he is functioning um, as a brain gate for the client meaning just giving you some endorphins to be unaware that's what he means by the gate like a block there Okay, well, let's not do the gating one here, but... Um, okay, let's just see, let's just skip that one for now. So we're prisoners of our childhood, we're prisoners of pain, we're prisoners, and then we're prisoners of belief. Pain makes just about everything shut down or constrict, including our perceptual apparatus. If a mother uses her son 
to take to satisfy her needs, he'll be unlike she will be unlikely to see the pain she's causing him. And our cognitive mind doesn't know that it's being used as a symbol for chasing the past mother's love. It's a part of it, right? And then when we create one of these beliefs, you know, we got, we got a, we're, we're, So to, to create the to to recreate um, the trigger for the endorphins, we create some false belief uh, that doesn't satisfy to get the endorphins, and but still believe in it. Disappointed endorphins, disappointed endorphins, and it kind of loops around like this. The right side of the brain tells the left side. Hey, I can't take any more pain here. And the left side says, okay, I'll defend you against having to feel it with a flurry of ideas to bury it. The left side ideation symbolizes what lies in the right side. It symbolizes, right? Now, you try to talk to, now you, you may try to talk to that person out of their core philosophy. The left side creates ideas that reflect, however obtuse, the feelings on the right even when the left side has no idea what is what is exactly on the right side. Ideas reflect feelings. So that's why it's so stubborn, right? So let's say you, you somebody is in a self-help cult thing or whatever, a religious uh, extremist kind of thing, and they say these beliefs, so uh, I'm superior, you're no superior, I'm good, you're no good. Or they make some kind of prejudice kind of thing. They don't know that that's a symbol for the pain. See, the pain creates the symbol. You see? And if you were to be aware that it's a symbol, you'd feel the pain, so they get sort of stubborn on the false belief as a defense against the pain. But the pain is creating that false belief. That's the point. The pain of being unloved, or trauma, birth trauma, or prenatal trauma, all that pain from early on, it's, it creates these uh, crazy beliefs um, that a spaceship's gonna come and save you, or, or you know, all these kind of things that he talked about in his book. So Janoff listed this whole long list of all these crazy uh, beliefs that some uh, uh, cults and um, self-help cult gurus. And, uh, and again, when we talk about religion, we're only talking about it in the context of, of when religion is being used as a tool of the plunder system. Right? So I'm not talking about victims of the plunder system. The essence of neurosis seems to be to concoct rationales for one's behaviors, which is driven by unrecognized forces. That is why one cannot penetrate elaborate rationales and explanation for another's behavior. For example, well, what's wrong with drinking a beer? Makes me, feel, makes me feel good, said somebody. He had no recognition of the constant tension he suffered. Where repressed pain exists, a scaffold of ideas is built around it. Right? The brain is able to adopt a don't bother me with facts attitude. You cannot be open-minded when you have heavy pain. When imprinted pain is so massive that the internal producers of blocking agents cannot secrete enough supplies to quell the pain, the person needs something external to tranquilize it. So for example, uh, cookies or comfort foods are sometimes summed to do the trick. Or, or a good solid belief system can do it. It adds to our internal drug supply. The brain is a wonderful pharmacy dispensing the necessary drugs on demand. Now who is doing the demanding? Well, our pain is, our biological system is. Our pain orders and reorders whenever necessary until we are out of stock. It means the brain can't do it anymore. Then you go to these beliefs and cookies. When there are too many orders going on for too long, supplies get exhausted. Then we literally have to go to the neighborhood pharmacy for help. 
here we see why people with horrific childhoods are candidates for addictions. Their natural painkillers are not up to the task. What also happens is we may uh, uh, flee into ideas, flights. When our emotional history doesn't contain too much pain, information is then shuttled to the front part of the cortex for meaning and understanding. When the pain is overwhelming from infancy and childhood, the left prefrontal area is left in the dark. It is then free to concoct all sorts of beliefs and the person becomes a receptacle for prepackaged beliefs by charlatans. So charlatans will give you a prepackaged belief Oh yeah, you'll be saved one day by some magic thing in the future. Yeah, just send me your money. So you're, you're, you're a receptacle for this because of your pain. The pain is dispersed into ideas, giving it force and tenacity. We would be not only arguing with their ideas, but something much deeper. Okay, you would be arguing with their traumatic childhood history. So these beliefs, okay, uh, it's related to hope. Hope stimulates we're talking about this uh, relentless hope, this fantasy hope that something in the present can heal you for the past, right? That kind of hope. Hope stimulates the production of serotonin endorphins, natural opiates manufactured precisely in those areas where pain and feelings are processed. It is then possible to become addicted to beliefs, i.e. hope, hope as beliefs, not only psychologically but physiologically, the dope of hope. Okay, one guy, for example, does something very crucial uh, for the phenomena of cults. He periodically, he makes statements about some coming disaster, right? Now, for those already imprinted with a catastrophe from birth to infancy, it resonates with their deepest fears from inside, a catastrophic memory projected outwardly, seen outwardly, externalized. Belief is the result of the cortex dealing with underlying imprinted pain. And then your cognitive side deals with the external world. So you still function in the external world normally in all this, but your beliefs are dealing with the pain. So one trick with some of these gurus is, um, oh, you felt birth trauma, an emotional catastrophe, near death experience, what a scary thing. Oh my God. So in his stories, he'll talk about some disastrous thing in the future as a symbol for the pain. So there's the hope. And then he says, oh, oh, but send me money. And I, 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 I'm, um, I'm, the, I'm the middleman for some, for some aliens. Or they'll say some crazy thing, right? Uh, for the, some powerful mysterious force. They're going to save you and be, you'll be saved. And it on, goes on and on like this, right? So that's sort of the gambit, right? Uh, tap into uh, their hope needs. Hope is a dope, uh, but the belief of the hope of the religious uh, cult-like gambit, yeah. it functions in the same way to disappoint, because to disappoint, you get endorphins, but the hope leads to disappointment. So you're, constantly, you're in this relentless hope, relentless disappointment, relentless and cycles around, and all of this is to keep tricking your brain to send you endorphins. Now, so the beliefs can do it, the cookies can do it, and in, and in extreme cases, they gotta run to the neighborhood pharmacy, accessory. Now they're gonna make vending machines for it, can you believe it? Now, if you don't, okay, his argument here, if you don't believe this, well, how about, how about the placebo effect? The brain didn't distinguish between real medicine and, um, you know, the placebo. So sometimes you, the doctor gives you a placebo, he tells you to believe it, you believe it and it worked, right? It could not distinguish, the person could not distinguish between an idea about medicine and the real medicine. That means that ideas can be opiates. We can believe in something uh, and that'll numb our pain. The belief systems. Now, if the person has some kind of belief system and if they're kind of like a realistic, authentic thing, and then the client feels their pain, and after they feel their true pain, the truth will upset you free, 
mother betrayed you, mother was so blind, mother didn't give you a secure attachment style, if you feel that real pain, then the belief system that you had before, if it was like a realistic thing, that'll still be there. Right? But if those old belief systems, before you felt the pain, were used as a defense or construction against the pain, then those fake belief systems will evaporate all by themselves. Okay, so let's continue this on this issue of the, the beliefs. Yeah, I'm still struggling myself. Again, my disclaimer, I'm not a shrink or a professor. I don't have a PhD or MA. I only have a BA. I'm not a counselor, midwife, doula, nutritionist. So my disclaimer, I'm not a doctor in all this stuff, right? So I'm just sharing the quotes. I'm trying to learn this myself. So kind of keep that all in mind, right? And 50% of what you're hearing is wrong. It's up to you to figure out which 30, 50%. He says, if you, have, if you believe something, if that belief, if, if you can identify it as so, if that belief is being used as a symbol and defense, a communication of and a hiding of your pain, if, if that's what the belief is about, okay, those beliefs, if you can recognize that it's for that, that the, that the beliefs, beliefs being used as a defense mechanism, those beliefs are there to, as code, they're a code for the pain. Now, and yesterday's video ended on that note, right? Um, so, belief systems, beliefs as defenses, they're codes, uh, code, like code, encryptions for your pain and you don't know it. So your beliefs are chasing symbolic mother and you don't know it. Now, you can only chase symbolic mother. You can never actually get it. No time machines, no morphing machines. So you keep on replaying the disappointment. The first pain led to endorphins. Pain, endorphins, pain, endorphins, right? Now the brain can handle a certain level of this, but if the pain is too much, the brain goes overload the, the demand exceeds internal supply, then they run to the then they run to the vending machine. I heard I heard that. I, I heard that they're gonna create vending machines that sell people aspirins and all these things. I don't know all this. So just trying to work on this idea of how hope uh, can be like a cookie. The client's belief system functions as a sort of life vest. If you take it away and he fears, he will be in danger of drowning in pain. Something's beep. Something's beeping. The lighting, yeah. So, so uh, not a perfect analogy, but uh, your belief, this hope, and all this, it's like a life vest. Uh, like, like a life vest. Take that away, you know, oh, the pain's gonna be swamped in pain. So that's why they're so rigid and stubborn in their of beliefs. Oh yeah, there, there's a magical power, there's a magic man in the sky who's watching you, who loves you, who's there for you. He's, he's, he's describing the breast. He doesn't tell you it's the breast, because that would, that would confront uh, your pain. So he doesn't use the word breast. So the gambit is, there's something in the sky that loves you, that knows you, it's there for you. And what you do is you describe the breast, but don't use the word breast. Make it a symbol of the breast. Describe a symbol. So the gambit of religion, when religion is being used as a tool of the pillage of the plunder system okay, on the aggressive side, the gambit on that, on that aggressive end is to get, people, to get the people in the audience to imagine a good breast in the sky. But don't use the word breast. But describe it. It's bountiful. It's so beautiful. It's so amazing. It's, so, it's there for you. It's unconditional for you. It's, it makes you feel so safe and warm. You describe how a baby would feel in paradise when he's nursing properly. And you kind of describe that kind of thing. The act of doing that, yeah, that's a symbol. So it gives people hope, the belief, the symbol, hope for it, right? So that's the chase. It disappoints. 
you get it you get click you get endorphins so you feel a little better so the fantasy gives you endorphins the belief fantasy gives you endorphins now if you're ready to admit the truth um, yeah if you can admit the truth that you didn't get mother's love she was so blind she was traumatized she didn't want she didn't want to be a mother at that time and you can admit the pain around that uh, then those beliefs okay it, it's a waste like it's you're it's wasting your time kind of thing because if you can if you can accept your feelings get back your feelings um, now you have yourself but if you don't have yourself, you're, you're searching for mother's love so you can have yourself. So if you can get yourself, um, that's, 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 the, that's the goal, to get back yourself, right? And sometimes, um, yeah, okay, here it is here. Ideas can have the force of drugs, right? And when those ideas are challenged, the person is in danger of a withdrawal symptom. Ideas are in fact chemical painkillers in the brain. And it is possible to become addicted to these ideas. So a person could be addicted to, uh, you know, religious dogma, religious dogma, again, when religion is being used as a tool of the pillage and the plunder system, not, not the victims. Huh? No one is going to let you, no one is going to let you take their fix away voluntarily. That is why it is urgent uh, that they join with other like-minded souls. Now we understand why someone can give up alcohol and find God, quote-unquote. Both have the same effect on the brain. Once the idea encompasses the fact that we are saved, that we don't have to die, that we live on in one fashion or another, that we are absolved of our sins, that we are not alone, etc. The idea will cause the secretion of pain-killing medicines in the brain. Okay, uh, the pain was too much to be felt, and, that I, and the ideas had rushed in to quell the pain. That is, they rushed in because of the pain. So because of the because of the pain, we rush in all these ideas. So a charlatan, on, a televangelist, turn on the TV. A televangelist gives you some prepackaged uh, beliefs. Your pain, whoosh, you absorb it in. And now that he's got you hooked in with the hope, oh, send me your checks, oh, send me your money. And all these guys are billionaires. Um, uh, it's amazing uh, the kind of lifestyle they have uh, just by selling you this uh, dope of hope, right? They're selling you the disappointment so that your own brain can trigger endorphins in your brain. Your brain released endorphins when you were disappointed. He wants to repackage that so you can get the endorphins. We can become addicted to our beliefs because they do trigger off the serotonin, pain-numbing neurohormones and, do and dopamine to keep us alert. The believer can love the universe, but is not very good at loving others. They often have a history of broken relationships. This is because defensive belief systems usually spell deep unconscious pain. So, more, so the more and more of being like a quote unquote true believer, that whole air fanatical religious area, the more pain there is, the more stubbornness of belief as a defense to get the endorphins that means a lot of pain. So in their genuine relationships, they have a hard time being intimate and affectionate because of the pain. Right? So yeah, a lot of these self-help cult gurus, they don't have a normal relationship, right? They're all addicts. Uh, they all have like a thousand women and one guy stamped them. Like, yeah, all these crazy things, this guy, right? Yeah, I don't know the details. He, he, mentioned, he mentioned one guy. What a doozy. What a doozy. One guy, one playboy, Don Juan type of guy, wanted a lot of pretty women. So he came up with a trick. 
he broadcasted it somehow in the 70s. I don't know, I don't know when it was. I, I don't know the story. I just, I just skimmed like it, like for half a second. Okay, another one. Because he, most of his book lists all these cult scams, all these uh, cult self-help guru scams. The whole, a whole long list of them. So that one little snippet one was kind of funny. I thought a little bit. He, he was an, he was a sect addict or something. Don Juan, Playboy kind of guy. He said, "Hey, de hey, dear pretty ladies out there, attention all beautiful ladies out there. I just I have just been in contact with these really super advanced, amazing humans that are like thousands of years ahead of us. These guys are amazing. Now they told me that the, that they want to visit us." Uh, and they want partners and they want pretty girls to be their wives and they've asked me to um, match make so you gotta so they want so they, they asked me <laughs> so you associate with me um, and all and they trust me so he wants to sleep with all these pretty women and the girls have the hope that if they that if they please the playboy, he'll say, check, okay, I'll match you with one of the super amazing, uh, super advanced humans that are from thousands of years in the future that are gonna come here to, and they need wives. They're lonely, they can't, they're coming back here to find some wives. Now these guys, although, okay, um, they'll meet your every whim, your every need, they're, they're these, they're like, forget about a good prince, like a thousand times better than that. Um, uh, they're so smart and warm and strong and uh, uh, they understand you, they know you and he describes these super um, future alien superhumans in a way um, that's symbolic breast. And these women, oh they're symbolic breast? Oh my god, all I gotta do is sleep with this con man and I, I might get a chance to be, find mother's love and I gotta wait for the alien ship to come and this, this and it worked. This guy had a long lineup of pretty girls uh, lining up, unbelievable, right? And Janoff was saying, this shows you the pain people are in. The, the pain is so immense that they're willing to, the hope of dope, right? They're, they're addicted to this hope. So you create some convoluted scheme that offers some kind of convoluted hope, but that hope is just a symbol, a symbol of the breast. And people are all rushing for it, right? So, um, yeah, okay. <laughs> somebody somebody asked Arthur Janoff, why did you become a therapist here? What's going on with you? He said, well, my mother had a history of, um, you know, being in therapy, right? And um, so, you know, I, I wanted to help her. I wanted to cure her, you see? So, and if I saved her and made her healthy, then she'd take care of me. Margaret Fox, yeah, that's her name. So the New York Times. Well, so when 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 Arthur Janow passed away in 2017, um, there was this like a, a like a tribute thing to a very good tribute thing in the New York Times by Margaret Fox. It's a good. You know, it's a very good. If you look up, I think New York Times will give you like one free read a month or something like that. It's worth the one. It's worth the one free read. Look up Arthur Janow dies 19. Dies at the age of 93, that one there. And, and that's a good summary of the whole thing with the guy. So, and in that article, she, she said that uh, he wanted to save his mother. Because a lot of people who become therapists, authentic therapists, they're still trying to save the parent. So, you see, stingers don't bother with that. People before, people traumatized before 18 months, they, they give up on all that. They just want to play infantile God, seek power, fame, prestige, and cynicism and, and hate and greedy and envy, they're just stuck in playing infantile God. They give up on that kind of thing. But some, but babies traumatized post 18 months still want to save the mother. So they transfer that prototype onto the world. They want to save everybody in, in that sense, wanting to save the mother. So a lot of therapists unconsciously choose the profession because they're still trying to save the mother because if they can save the mother, they'll get her love, and that's what they need. So they're still in that loop. Then they, and then they finally, and then, they, then they're aware of it. Okay, then, then they can mourn it. And whether or not 
after they're aware of it, they continue to be a therapist, I don't know. But that's how a lot of people start, he said. If we didn't have a strong, a very strong emotional relationship with our parents early in life, the right hemisphere imprints will become a template or a blueprint for adult life that may cause constant broken relationships. We are victims of that template. That reminds me of the, the other quote we have. Um, the lady was complaining to the shrink. The shrink said to her, Oh yeah, these complaints, these problems you're saying, we may say that this is what your script is doing to you. Let us as a team work together to see what we can do with that script. It's a traumatic script. We recreate what caused it, hoping to undo it, change it. So you want to be conscious of it so then you can unpick the threads of a traumatic script. Use those threads to weave a new healthier script. A feeling person cannot pretend that a bad childhood never happened. Challenging, uh, interesting statement there. So if you're in this blissful denial, oh no, mother was a goddess, and you put her on a pedestal, okay, well. Now that's a defense mechanism. The mother's a person, she made mistakes, um, she, it was hurtful, something positive, something hurtful, get a balanced, honest appraisal. Not this worship pedestal thing, or the opposite, you say how bad she was. I find some kind of middle, middle ground there. Just one little, uh, one little tidbit about um, the importance of love early in life. He said that uh, somebody blindfolded, uh, was it a cat or something? Some poor little kitten came out of the womb and immediately the experimenter put blindfolds over the cat for a couple of years or something, or for a few, I don't know what the timing, oh, for the few, first few months. Animals who are blindfolded in the first few months of life never develop visual brain pathways and are functionally blind thereafter. No amount of visual stimulation later on will make a difference. Just like us with love. It's no different with us with love. Except that when love is lacking early in life, we cannot see it in front of us. So the cat has the biology to see, but he didn't have the experience of seeing. He re they removed the blindfold and he was functionally blind all of his life, that cat. In humans, we don't get the love. It's like the blind, we're blinded to love. A few months later, we, don't, we never recognize it. We're blind to love. We can't recognize it, can't feel it, can't appreciate it, can't take it in. We don't, it's past that critical period. So that's, that's, so we're, in other words, we're like blinded cats, in other words, right? It's a metaphor. So if I understand it correctly, a cat came, a kitten came out, he put a blindfold over the cat for a few months. He removed the blindfold. But biologically, the, the cat's eyes are still functioning. He could still physically, organically see, but he didn't have the experience of seeing. So the neural pathways, the wiring didn't set in. But the, but the, so he was blind the rest of his life. But he could he could see, but the blindfold caused that. Right? Well, babies, okay, babies they don't get love. They're love blinded because of mother's soul blindness. Mother's soul blindness puts like a love blind. In other words, the baby's not getting any kind of love. He's not seeing it, he's not feeling it. Not, mother, where are you? Where are you? Gasly, ouch, mother, no, where, where's your love? He's, he's being blinded. Where's, right? And then a few months later, he'll never recognize it, just the way the cat can never see afterwards. You know? His imprinted trauma needs a current focus to make his body feel in harmony. 
Matching the outside to the inside from the past to the present is the linchpin of neurosis. Oh yeah, that's okay, that's a follow-up. Uh, that self-help religious guru who said, oh, some disaster outward. Well, that's as above, so below. That's a metaphor for the below. So the, in, the, the in, emotional disaster, okay, a wreckage, the emotional wreckage. Okay, Emily Dickinson, the baby had a great hope. It fell. You heard no noise. The wreckage was within. Oh, cunning tail, the charlatan. Huh? Mother was a charlatan. Oh, cunning tail. She exploited her power. Oh, cunning tail that let no witness him. That's the scarecrow guy with no brain in the Wizard of Oz. There is a kind of neurological cable, the corpus callosum, which connects the two hemispheres in terms of feelings. Over 80% of all feelings are transmitted over this cable. It can be impaired by early trauma so that the messages do not get from one side to another easily. When feelings cannot travel directly to the cortex, they take circuitous routes. So we're supposed to be able to feel our trauma. We can't feel it. It scoops around into the brain. Give me an idea, give me some hope, give me false belief. Believe in spaceships, believe in, okay? So that's, and that's like a symbol for that. But it, Yeah, this is a little question mark on my end here. I remember one joke was, women have a super highway between the two hemispheres, so they recognize what they feel. The right side feels, the left side knows, recognize what the right side feels. Yeah. But men have a dirt road, they said. It takes a long time for them to recognize the feeling. So the feeling skips around to the language, they'll say stuff, Right? That stuff is code for the feeling, but they don't know it. To be feelingless, to live in one's mind and flight from the truth about our childhood stored in the body. Right? So the truth about our childhood is stored in the body in that early part of the brain and then we flight um, in the mind we're not feeling once a person finds himself he has found all the meaning there is okay now here's his sales pitch okay um, so to, okay the growth therapist and weekend seminar okay all these fake uh, self-help uh, weekend seminars right the growth therapist, human potential movement, all this. Have been able to make part of primal behavior socially acceptable. That is, the actual pain imprint has been disconnected from all of its physiologic and physical manifestations so that a person can act out all of the pain without feeling it. He can release the energy of the pain without ever really understanding what this pain is what this pain is releasing. What his pain is releasing. That's the attraction, seduction, and beauty of this. The only thing that doesn't work. So he claims the difference between the authentic scream and his fake scream is that the fake scream you don't know why you're screaming. You're just screaming because maybe you're angry at something in the present. You're acting like an actor on TV. So the weekend workshops have co-opted the authentic idea of primal screen, disconnected it from um, how it's supposed to be conceived of, but it's appealing to get people to get people to do something in the workshop. So people go to the workshop, the, 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 the con man says, oh here, beat the pillow. Come on, just beat the pillow, say some things. 
Um, did it work? Nonsense. Well, Althea, Althea Horner about this said, well, you gotta know why you're angry. They don't even know why they're angry. Just beat the pillow. Why am I beating the pillow? Why aren't you angry or something? About, what am I angry about? I don't know, just beat the pillow. It'll work, come on, just beat the pillow. Give me your money, beat the pillow. Come see. And they're confused, so, and it doesn't work. Althea Horner says, well, at least, at least make the link that anger is an expression of unmet needs. That anger is linked to attachment. The person, as a baby, didn't get a secure attachment stuff. That's why they're angry. There's no point in beating the pillow. You gotta be conscious of what the anger's about. Okay, so in the Disney film Inside Out, Joe and Sadness got zooped away, mainly angers at the console, right? The limbic system. The feelings of the mammal got zipped away, right? So anger's there because joy and sadness got zooped away. Now why did joy and sadness get zooped away? FNN, feelings and needs. The needs for a secure attachment style work map. So joy and sadness got zooped away. Then you go back to the brainstem and, he's, and, and your impulsive re reactivity there. So, Janoff says that his therapy decodes belief systems by getting down to what really underlies them. It is like pulling back the curtain and peeping in at one's ancient history. No one can make anyone conscious. That is an internal state arrived, arrived at not from outside, but from inside. Consciousness arises only from internal processes of feeling one's unconscious. When the original hurt is experienced, the imprint rises to the top level, making sense of it all. So when we <laughs> can identify the traumatic script to our consciousness, now we know what's going on. To feel the needs, uh, to feel the, also in terms of transference, instead of just transferring, well, feel the needs one is transferring. Feeling the needs that one is transferring puts an end to the acting out. So we transfer the past into the present, act out like a theater thing. The goal, the, the goal is to recognize what unmet feelings is, it, is this about? What unmet feelings and needs that weren't met are you hoping to get met in the person of the present? Get in touch with those feelings. Recognize that your anger at the person in the present is not at that person. It's back to the source. So if, if you say to your friend, oh, you're such a heartbreaker, unrequited love, oh, you're, you cheated me, you're a heartbreaker, how can you be so cruel, you're determined to, to all these things people say, we'll take it to the source. Okay. So what one um, at, at the end uh, at the end of the last uh, quote here, let's see. Yeah. So one guy complained, you know, my girlfriend doesn't listen to me. He said to her, Well, feel the hurt. This will lead you back to who really didn't listen to you. So the guy was complaining, no, my friend doesn't listen to me. My girlfriend never listens to me. I don't get him. Well, feel the hurt. That's a minor thing. Feel the hurt. Your pain is about the past. It's just being triggered. And in fact, you chose her for that purpose. You were attracted to a woman who would listen to you so you could discover and know and feel that your mother didn't listen to you. Remember the baby's creating neural pathways in the brain? The, the relationship, the interpersonal, leads to the intrapsychic. The baby's laying down neural pathways by the relationship with the mother. It's, it's, a, it's frozen there, it's a problem. Brody calls it unfinished business with the mother. So you look for somebody in the present who reminds you of the mother. That's going to trigger the wiring with the mother. That's called falling in love, okay. puppy love, infatuation, spellbound, love trance. You're the one, you're, you're, you're the one, you're everything. Okay, so the breast mother was everything. Person for all oh, your everything, you're the one, right? You're looking for the one. Look, Mr. Right, Mr. Mrs. Right. So the person of the present reminds you of the mother. 
that triggers the wiring. Now the original wiring with the mother was that you were in an oceanic blissful oneness with the mother. The baby is in an oceanic blissful oneness with the mother. Okay. This, this happy Garden of Eden, heavenly, paradisical feeling. The baby has that with the mother. So it's set there. So somebody, the present reminds you of the mother, you're going to get that. So, that's, so now, you're, now you're spellbound by the person in the present. But you're only spellbound by someone who has the same psychology like the mother who didn't listen to you that caused you to, that caused you to freeze up. So you're attracted to the person in the present and they're seen as an emotional reincarnation of the mother in the past. So you're transferring the mother in the past to the partner in the present. So now, now why did you do that? The part in the present is not the mother in the past. The part in the present uh, cannot invent a time machine or a morphing machine, take the two of you back to the past, change the past, provide the correct neural pathway wiring, hop back in the time machine, come back to the present, morph into your respective places. This is not gonna happen. So you're gonna say to the person in the present, you failed me, you cheated me, you're, you didn't listen to me, you're a heartbreaker, you're a fushwiga, how can you be so cruel, how can you be so cold? You're talking about the mother. You chose and you're attracted to someone who reminds you of the mother and your feelings are gonna be triggered up in the present. That's now take it to the source. That's why you chose that person to know what happened in the past. This is the, this is the innate drive for healing. We're recreating the past and the present to know how we felt in the past. We're trying to get back our feelings. Okay, the trauma is we lost our feelings. So we, we are recreating what caused that to be aware of that, you see? Again, my girlfriend doesn't listen to me. Okay, well, feel the hurt. And then um, find out who really. Trace it back, go back. Who really didn't listen to you? Okay, so now we can play the song. It must be something psychological by Katie Lee. A very good song. It's really quite explainable, she, sa she sings. She only likes guys who are unattainable. Her mother was emotionally unavailable. She was unattainable. So if there's a man who's also unattainable, emotionally unavailable, that's why she's so attracted. It's really quite explainable. It's not logical, it's psychological. She's trying to feel. She's recreating what caused the loss of feelings and the pain around them. Recreated with others like in a theater thing. It comes up. Take that to the source now. Don't blame the person in the present. The person in the present was just a stimulus trigger for the mother in the past. The person in the present doesn't cause that pain the mother in the past causes. Don't blame the person in the present for what the pain of the pain that the mother caused in the past. So um, the person in the present is disappointing, okay, you get it. Um, but that deep enraged pain is with the mother. Right? Now you gotta forgive her, why? Maybe the mother, when she was in the uterus, had prenatal trauma, prenatal distress syndrome. Right? Maybe she had birth trauma. Maybe she didn't get a secure attachment style. So, so if the mother's traumatized, she's gonna replay her trauma. So she has a baby, she's herself onto the baby. She plays the shaming mother, shames her own baby to replay how her mother had shamed her so she can know that her mother had shamed her. She repeats what happened to her so she can know what happened to her. This is called looking for story. Meets the feelings. Um, a person with a narcissistic pattern has to re-experience all the neglect that made him constantly self-referent, which is the hallmark of narcissism. As one novelist has put it, quote, when you get on the wrong trail, every stop you make is the wrong one. We are prisoners of our childhood, reacting to realities that no longer exist, or more accurately, recreating old realities over and over again. So the, tra the trauma creates a traumatic script, not a healthy script, a traumatic script. And we are seeing it, recreating it, so we're on the wrong road, so to speak, so everything is the wrong stuff. Okay, this next one here. 
Why is it that when you talk to someone like who's a religious believer fanatic, I'm talking again, those who are um, members of the plunder system, why are they so incoherent? Like you said this, that is, that's not consistent with that. Why is it so flip-floppy in all this? Why is there a lack of coherence? Because in trauma, things are so fragmented. Now you're entering into the primary process mentation. Double think. Hocus pocus, auto hypnosis. So, for example, if a person has, if a person is traumatized very early on, and let's say they develop the bully personality pattern. So, mother hurt them. They identify with her. Okay, find others to play themselves, play the mother. Okay, so they're negative towards others the way the mother was negative towards them. When they replay that, on some level, they feel the pain of that. Then they say the one they just hurt in the present is the mother who hurt them back in the past. Now, the person in the present who was your no good you is now your bad mother. So the baby originally felt no good, one with the shaming mother. He's both the no good self and the shaming mother. Finds somebody else first, sees them as a no good you, treat them the way you were treated so you can know how your mother was treated, now you feel badly. Then you fly the boogeyman image onto the victim and say the one that you just hurt is the, is the one who hurt you back in the past. Now you see that your victim as the one who just hurt, is threatening one. See, this, this is what the cat means in Alice in Wonderland. Up is down, left is right, here is there, no time. It's all this flip-flopping. That's why they're not coherent. That's why this, and they don't care uh, because they're, it's, this flipping around is, is because of the pain. It's all the pain. Alice in Wonderland, all this stuff in the Alice in Wonderland, it's because of the pain. Can't feel this, go there, can't feel this, go there, can't feel this, go there. Huh? All this crazy talk, right? Back to Chilliwack. I have the second Chilliwack reference I made in a row. Yesterday I made a, we made a reference to Chilliwack song, Communication Breakdown. And now Chilliwack has another song called Crazy Talk. Not a good song, I don't care, yeah, I'm not a fan of it, but I, I'm just reminded of it, yeah. We have two songs on our soundtrack by the classic rock band Chilliwack. Um, uh, Fly at Night and uh, Arms of Mary. Yeah. yeah, so Arms of Mary, yeah. So he hopes his girlfriend, he wants to be in his mother's arms. Uh, just give me a second here, hold on. Still recording? Okay. Oops. Um, you know, this, this Janoff, these Janoff quotes are a little different in a way. Um, the best way to, uh, in my opinion, to kind of grasp this thing here is to not look at just any um, set of quotes for a video that we're doing here from 45 to, to the current one. You got to look at the whole batch of them. And it's a little choppy. It's a little choppy. I've been a little, I've been a little disorganized with this material. To tell you the truth, that's why I'm, I'm kind of referring to the previous quotes all the time. But the but the three. I hope I've covered the three main points: primary circuit, something in the present, a stress in the present triggers it, and we feel the old way. Transfer the, transfer the past trauma, prototype trauma, original trauma, original defense, 
and you reuse that old thing in the present, um, the memory, repetition, compulsion, look for symbolic of the missing mother, symbolic. The symbolic is disappointing. The symbolic can take two forms, uh, cookies and material and so on, or ideas and beliefs and hope, because the baby had hope and it fell, pain, endorphins, hope, false lie, relentless hope, disappointment, hope, endorphins. So hope is like a hope of drug. Yeah, I think I kind of kept it, sort of. But we mean hope in this context. When we say the word hope in this, in this defensive way, we mean it when it's a defense against pain. We don't mean like practical, real, realistic kind of hope when you have like a, you know, you have your connection to your authentic interests and you have that kind of hope from there. Like you have like an expression of your real self and you hope people like it and if they don't, well, but it's not that kind of like, not, it's not a defense against pain hope. It's like, it's like a positive hope, like a, a pleasure of sharing uh, that kind of hope, right? Like I hope, I hope you're happy, I hope you're well, like, a, you know, I wish you're happy and well. Let me take a break. Oh, maybe, um, yeah, I'm not used to that. Uh, maybe I should use one of these chairs. Oh, that's what I should do here. Oh, maybe it's these benches that are driving. I'm speaking to in a mild back pain the whole time. These are better. Oh my god, why don't I just use these chairs? Oh, these, these chairs are good. These are good chairs. Hold on a sec. Let, let me move over here. Hey, give me a second. Let me unplug this. Copyrighted music, yeah. Oh, my back. Johnny Sarno. About the back. Yeah, different, different angle here. That's where I was sitting over there. Uh, that techno thumping is probably copyrighted. You know, yesterday's video, um, there were like uh, 20 songs, all copyrighted, but uh, they, they didn't block the video. Sometimes they'll say copyrighted, but they won't block the video. Ah. Ironically, it's quieter over there, right? I've never been here, actually. Oh, it's nice in here, yeah. Oh, there you are. I see. There, there, there you go. There you went.
Oh, oh. <laughs> he almost uh, grabbed the phone. Huh? <laughs> oh, I saw. So people do feed them. Is that what it is? Okay. Here's the, here's the back area. It's nice in here too. And here are the peacocks I told you about last time, yeah. Oh, there's a cute rabbit here. Yeah. You can see him there. They've got rabbits and doves and peacocks in here. Yeah, cool. They look like baby doves, eh? Really young ones, eh? Can you see them through the grill there? I don't know, not too well, eh? Actually, I can, I can show you that. in the tree there. We'll do one more uh, video of Arthur Janoff's. All right, don't don't grab the phone, eh? I need the phone. Come on. See how are we doing with the lighting? Maybe I'll keep this a short video here. 4:30. Battery's okay.
the unconscious hope of fulfillment of old, unfulfilled needs. Pain automatically makes one honest with oneself while it does away with unreal belief systems. We never got and will never get what we needed as a child. The death of unreal hope is the birth of life. So you can imagine this uh, metaphor in Myths of Fairy Tales. Okay, the, the, the rebirth kind of thing, right? The death of the old false stuff, fantasy that you're gonna get. Recognize it, that's like a death of a false belief, then, there's, then now you're getting back your new life. That's like the second birth. Right? The white guy's doing the same thing I am, he's going around with a camera. Oh yeah, many people who do what I call pseudo or mock primal therapy, primal therapy simply get people to beat on the walls, scream and cry out of context. Their screaming and crying is directed from outside rather than emanating from the imprint of the old traumas one has tried to deceive himself. Yeah, so that, that's, that's his huge selling point, I think. That most of these rebirthers and self-help scams, it's really you're just deceiving yourself. If you think beating the pillow is your back at the birth canal and you're really screaming from that place. If we're gonna change the imprint, we gotta go to that kind of place. That's his main argument. Which, I don't know, I'm still, that's a huge question mark. You know, now that I know more about this stuff, um, I'd be curious yeah, to learn more about it, you know, if that's possible. Well, what, an, uh, what an appealing, what an immensely appealing idea that if there is some kind of visualization or breathing technique or some guided procedure that's safe and you're still aware and, it's, and you're conscious, See, you want to make the unconscious conscious. You can't do it without consciousness. You got to be aware. Yeah. But the self-help scams say, "Oh, just beat the pillow." What? Why? What are we aware of? I don't know. Just beat the pillow. Oh, okay. People. Uh, it was a scam. Oh, thanks for your money. See, see you next weekend. Oh. There's another one. I guess they're looking for cookie, for crumbs or something, eh? Yeah, as one novelist has put it, when you get on the wrong trail, every stop you make is the wrong point. So it's it's the wrong trail, right? Repeating the past in the present in one form or another. Even, either in the benign way, where you play yourself and get others to reject you, or you play the rejector and reject others to replay how the, how the mother rejected you. It's kind of like a wrong trail, right? It's like we're doing this wrong thing over and over again. And every time you do it, it's like the wrong stop because it's the wrong trail. Oh, that song's copyrighted for sure, eh? Well, you might not be hearing me, eh? Maybe I'm... Okay, I might just keep it a short video. We'll keep it as a short video here. Yeah, I noticed, I noticed the difference. I think I'm getting a little dependent on... I think... Not having the caffeine this time around, I feel a little uh, less uh, 
energized, right? I just drank some kind of sleepy kind of tea, or chamomile tea or something. Tea or something. Just like some regular herbal tea or something. Um, anyways, um, yeah, usually when I have a caffeine, I can go four to five hours, right? Now I'm only at two hours, right? Two and a half. Yeah. Okay, never mind my delivery. I gotta, I gotta stay on track here. Uh, I think the value here is getting these quotes out, getting them available. You can have it on your iPhone for for a minor administrative fee through the copy page. You can have this resource, 10,000 quotes, 2,000 pages single space like this. You know, it's, it's quite an encyclopedia. Robert Bly's advice: spend 10 minutes a day. You know. It's an act of self uh, reparenting. It's um, your own exiled baby. You want to adopt yourself, kind of thing. Well, those are yeah. That's uh, that's all parking lot. Hey, that building there. It's all garage. Se several levels of a parking lot. Oh yeah, they've got an upstairs here too. This is this is a wonderful, uh, fun kind of. I'm sure a lot of happy memories were made in this venue here. It, it, it's it's old. It's an old, obviously it's an older place, but it's in good, it's in good condition and all that. It has a kind of old classic feel to it as well. Yeah. This this is probably some kind of landmark. Uh, Uh, not really nice staff, my goodness, yeah, they really, uh, uh, they really do well in that department, yeah. Oh, there's, uh, there's the other swan. He woke up. He's a funny character. He's usually on one foot, this guy. Isn't that funny? He sleeps standing on one foot. I think I see him there. He's not sleeping, but he's still on one foot. He's, he, he thinks he's a pelican or something. Okay, I'll see you in part seven. In part seven, we'll do some more quotes from Arthur Janoff. One, uh, yeah, back, back to the prototype. Yeah, in the next, in part seven, we'll include the quote. So coming up in part seven, sort of a variation on a theme. Um, the, the woman um, had an emergency uh, at the birth, right? And she was stuck there in the canal. And she was trying to get out. And it was a near-death experience. She, she almost didn't make it. And she... Uh, had a real desperation at the birth, uh, birthing time. And it became a prototype for her. So she wanted to buy tickets uh, for the train or something, and she missed it or something. She had to wait for the next day or something. She was enraged. Like she wanted to escape, like leave the town, like go out. Not being able to leave the city on schedule uh, triggered the memory in the canal when she wanted to get out. Now she couldn't get out. She thought he, she wasn't going to make it. Right? So in the present, not being able to leave the city, catch the train, it triggered that she was in the canal and couldn't. Look at these guys, eh? So she reacted with the emotions that she had in the canal of, of terror, of feeling terrorized that she, that she had to escape, she had to get out. Don't keep me in here any longer, mother. 
uh, relax, relax the cervix, let me get out here, have some connection with me here. And she was stuck in there and she was enraged, in immense fear and rage. So that's the primary circuit in daily life. If there's something that prevents her from getting out of the city or something, right? she's reminded of that old time and replays that terror and fear. And that's called neurotic because she's in the present, feels like the past. So she was, she threw a, an immense fit uh, at the train counter and she was enraged. And, you know, you see that at airports sometimes, right? They miss the flight and they're in rage and all this. So she was in that kind of rage place. Um, because at that moment she couldn't think clearly. She couldn't say, okay, I'll just get, catch the next train. Okay, it's inconvenient, yeah, but it doesn't cause, it's not a life or death issue. But she reacted emotionally as if it were a life and death uh, issue. That's, that's neurosis. That's, that's his uh, idea of defining neurosis. He defines neurosis sort of in that way. Yeah, so, that, yeah, I'm, I'm, um, I feel, uh, it's been nourishing, it, it's been nourishing uh, in a way, these quotes. So we've just completed six videos, yeah, 45, yeah, six videos. We started with 2745, this one here is 2750, has six videos. And the next one will be the seventh video. Probably the last, seven or seven. We did a seven video run on greed. We did a whole marathon last year. Seven videos. 130 quotes, I think it was, on greed. We did a seven video marathon on Martha Stark's work. And, um, I remember we did a five video special run on this transfer and stuff, the puppy love one. Uh, you know, a lot, of author, a lot of good authors sometimes have two videos of just of their work. Right? Like Thomas Ogden had like two or three videos. Good Trip, likewise. Grass Team, yeah, likewise. Yeah, these are cute birds, eh? They're... Yeah, you can of see that one's sort of standing on the at the back of the chair, there's the black and white one. Yeah, and that, that quote about the three brains is coming up in part seven. We have three brains. Usually we say the tritune brain, right? The cortex, limbic, brainstem. Why, oh, yeah, that comedy thing, uh, that, that comedy thing was, uh, like, the cortex, we can speak, so, right? In the limbic, the second brain, it's emotional, right? But the brainstem, what sounds does that make? Like what sounds do snakes and and uh, rattlesnakes and lizards make? You see, so that brain makes those kinds of primal sounds, right? The mam mammal brain, like 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 uh, birds and dogs, horses, right? mammals, and then the cortex we can speak. Right? That's like the three kinds of brains. But the, but the memory of the trauma takes place in that lizard time. So it sends up into the speaking time, speaking brain, the cortex brain. So it can only speak, have beliefs, ideas, symbols of chasing for the primal need for the breast mother. And the act of doing this means that we're not aware of it. The trauma means we're not gonna be aware of it. So that's what the whole journey is about, to be aware of it and have some ability to be aware of it. We've got to create a level of safety within ourselves to let the feelings come up, right? And the awareness makes us more mindful, I guess, as well, right? We can make better choices as well. Uh, that, that's, uh, 
Das ist ein bisschen They fly away quickly. Oh my god, yeah. Well, it'd be expensive for high school kids to do their homework here after school, right? A little bit, a little bit pricey right now. But that's a, quite a... That, that, that'd be quite a fun place to meet after, high, after class. Come here with your friends and do your homework together or something, right? That'd be too expensive, yeah. The prices would add up, right? Yeah, part seven. I'm not. I'm not even fully sure. Um, it's it's in progress. Part part uh, the quotes for part seven are are, are in the making. So it's, it's in the pipe. It's in the pipeline. So yeah. For example, uh, I think he said like about worry. Like 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 generally speaking, when people worry about stuff, that worry. Um, it's the fear from the limbic system and expresses itself when we worry about stuff. And usually most worry is not for real, right? It's, it's something in the past coming up. So you're triggered of some past pain and it's coming out in your worries. Right? That's why people say most worry, it, wasn't, it was for nothing, right? It's, it's in reference to the past, right? And the issue of trauma is that we're not aware, we're not, we don't make that link of, of the present and the past. But when the baby's loved, he can have an awareness that something in the present might be reminding him of the past and have that feeling that something from the past is involved and he can accept it and he can make meaning and sense uh, of things. But without that link, we're repeating to find the link. Okay, so I don't really have any humorous or fun little thing to say at the end. Uh, sometimes I try to uh, see if something funny might... See if I can end on a happy, funny note, or at least a musical note. Devram Kaya, yeah, I, I showed you a fig tree, uh, yes, two days ago, a fig tree. Devram Kaya, uh, a singer from Turkey, has a very nice song about a fig tree. But that same singer has a great song about grief called uh, Humu Kusu. The name of the song, Humu Kusu. And the singer is Devram, uh, it's her, her, her first name and her family name is Kaya. Uh, what a great song. Oh, we got a lot of great songs uh, from Ziana Zane from Malaysia. Great, great singer. Oh my God. Um, yeah. 
wonderful singer. Those, yeah, two great singers. That's another, I love our soundtrack, yeah. We got lots of uh, songs from around the world. Um, and uh, and uh, classic rock and... Uh, oh yeah, we, we recently added a new Lynn Miles song. So, um, I know it was love, that one there. So we've got uh, the heart that lives in winter. The heart that lives in winter, yeah, that's the emotional hypothermia of trauma. Huh? The heart is always frozen, right? Stuck. Uh, something beautiful about the environment. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, I know it was love, yeah. But, and she, she touched on the difference between uh, the manic uh, love that, that's too exciting and uh, it was that kind of love. I know it was that kind of love. Not not like a healthy love. It was this manic, excited, blissful, ecstatic, back with the mother's breast in, in your in your wiring because the person in the present reminds you of the past. It was that kind of love. And you can do anything. Love conquers all that. Mother and a baby, powerful duo, you know. Uh, so, yeah. So we, have now, we now have three songs uh, by Lynn Miles, the folk singer on our soundtrack. Uh, Faron, uh, one, another folk singer. We've got about three of three excellent songs of hers on our soundtrack. Yeah. So we've got some folk music, classic rock, um, a little, little bit of opera, uh, and a lot of songs from around the world. In the, a lot of great songs by indigenous singers, uh, Beatrice Deer and um, and friends. Yeah, a lot, a lot of songs. Willie Dunn, Willie Mitchell. And uh, the Cashton band, Todd McKenzie, and uh, Kelly Fraser, yeah, and uh, Sylvie Bernard, Jenny Luzon, and uh, Kalo Lynn Johnson, a nice song called Gentle Warrior, yeah. Um, Ely, yeah, we said Ely Sappy. Susan Aglukark, yeah, a couple of hers, and, uh, and so on, yeah, many, many more, yeah. Oh, I'm just now finally cooling off, hey, can you believe it? It took me almost three hours to cool off. I came here drenched in sweat, now I'm finally cooling off because it's a bit of a breeze here. I'm still ho I'm still hoping for some kind of fun little ending, some fun fun little thing to say at the end. We've got the pigeon joke. Uh, we've got uh, primal therapy decodes belief systems by getting down to what really underlies them. It's like pulling back the curtain and peeking in at one's ancient personal history. The death of unreal hope, fantasy hope, right? Like the Peer Gints and the Don Juans and the Playboys. Right? Yeah, a lot of people with the narcissistic pattern never give up on them. They maintain the belief that they're an infantile god and create rationalizations for it. And it's relentless. They, they can go all the way to the end with that, right? It's just too much painful. So the narcissism is dealing with an immense amount of pain that's masked over. Uh, so what did he say here? Yeah. I think there was one reference to, yeah, uh, the narcissist has to re-experience all the neglect that made him constantly in this uh, making it all about himself. Yeah, lack of empathy, don't care about others, looking at number one, useful for me, great, not, if not, who cares, just extremely uh, self-centered, self-referent.
And if they have the resources and they can fool people, they can do that the whole, the whole time. But there's little hunches that come up. I'm sure they got feedback from others. Why are you such a fill in the blank? Or why are you so cold and selfish? I'm sure they got some, oh, of course they'll bombastically uh, be angry if someone questions their belief that they're an infantile God, special chosen, this whole thing, right? By the, yeah, by the way, again with that chosen. Somebody said that the odds of a person being on the planet or anyone being here are, is uh, one in 400 trillion. So the great spirit out there, the nature and all this, and you're here, the chances of you being here are one in 400 trillion. So from that healthy perspective, we're all chosen. The great spirit, nature, and we're here, okay, each person being here, one in 400 trillion chance. So we're all chosen in a healthy way. But if you say it in a pathological way, you're saying it in, well, uh, I, you know, you're saying it, meaning my humanness, I don't want it. You can have my humanness, you're no good. That, if they mean it that way, that's, that's a sign of narcissism. So the main, so one image for the, the cure for narcissism is uh, the TV series uh, uh, called The Odyssey, starring Armando Sante. Uh, took him 20 years to get to his 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 feelings, his his inner home. Home is when they say home, they mean his inner home, his embodiment. And then he was reunited with Penelope. He got back his feelings. Right? I feel that for him. Took him 20 years, right? Lots of temptations, but he had to he had to start off by looking at the unconscious. When Odysseus was in the underworld, he saw Sisyphus in there. Odysseus looked into Sisyphus's face and he saw that it was his face. He saw his mother down there. He saw how he betrays himself, the way his mother betrayed him. That's Agamemnon. So he then he kind of okay. Now he knows what's going on. He's like Sisyphus betrays himself, mother betrayed him. He's in this loop. Okay, now he's got to find his, 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 so he lost, he never found, he never had a, he had a home, but he doesn't remember it, he's got to find it. We all had a home at birth, it's a given. We're all given an inner home, we're all given it. It's nature, right? Even that tree has it. Everything in nature has their inner home. But humans, we lose it with trauma. We're home with trauma, cousin. So we're looking for something we never even knew we had, right? We had it, but, didn't, but don't remember it. We lost our inner home before the hippocampus came online. So we're looking for something. Go, no, go, I know not whither, and bring back, I know not what. The title of one fairy tale. Huh? When you get on the wrong trail, every stop you make is the wrong one. Okay, let's just let's just end the video here. Sorry for not providing any kind of humorous joke at the end here. Maybe I can just end up with a, with a picture of Charlie here. Let's see if we can find Charlie. Maybe he has something to say. We haven't given him a, a name yet. Hey, Charlie. Yeah, you, Charlie, Charlie. Well, last I, I've never given him food, so I don't think he's gonna associate me with food.
Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll just, I'll see you in part seven. Uh, hopefully I'll... If their coffee machine, if their coffee grinder is broken, maybe I'll bring in some coffee from home or from another shop. Oh no, yeah, no, I can't do that. Right? Well, hopefully, uh, they'll coffee, hopefully their coffee machine will, will be repaired by the time I come back here. Because this tea stuff, it makes me a little, um, not as, uh, you know, Yeah, that's something. That's something about about it. For the past year and a half, I've been doing these videos with with one coffee. So I've noticed a little improvement in my delivery uh, in the past year and a half here. But prior to that, I I don't drink coffee, so all my videos are maybe a little more more sluggish, I guess, or slower. But I gotta keep it, I wanna keep it at that kind of, uh, I don't wanna be dependent on coffee to be able to do a decent video. I wanna still be able to do a decent video whether or not I, I have a coffee, right? We are family! Song in the background. Sis, sister Sledge, is that right? We are, we are all family. I don't know if you're hearing this, but we are all family. Jane Elliott says we're all technically cousins. On average, 30 to 50 times removed. Right. When we became Homo sapiens back in Africa, spread around, we're all from that massive family. We're all from that massive family. We're all Africans and we're all cousins. We are family. But trauma, we're confused. We got on the wrong road. But let's see, yeah, let's end up with that song there. We are family. See you in part seven. Thanks very much.